we're going to, um, we're going to talk about an hour, I'd say, we'll see how we go. And if I hear snoring, I'll probably draw it to a close sooner than that. So, snore loudly. Um, and the thing is, if you could hold questions to the end, that would be great. Uh, can you hear me and see me? Yes. Yeah, and you can see the slides too, right. So, um, going Dutch. It started off just going Dutch, and then as I started doing more and more research, it got a question mark, and I'll explain that as I go along. But even this, well, especially this gallery has a direct link to Holland and the Low Countries, because I'm sure many of you will know or remember that in 2000 it was extended to the designs of a Dutch architect, Eric van Egeraat. Um, so there's a simple and obvious link there. But I think we're going to go back a little further in time than that. So we're looking here at the, basically the second half of the 17th century and 18th century. So this is a, an image that many of you will be very familiar with. It's on more or less permanent exhibition in the gallery. At the moment it's up in the Penrose rooms on the first floor. And um, this image was kind of what spurred Anne and Michael to ask me to have a look at the Dutch links in Cork because um, there are lots of things that are kind of asserted about um, the relationship between Holland and the Low Countries and, and Cork especially. Uh, for example, that the Mardike was laid out by a Dutchman in 1719 or that houses in Cork were built of Dutch brick. Uh, so here's something fairly typical. This is from the Evening Echo or the Echo in 2019. The Dutch influence in Cork City is still evident in the architecture of the city. The reclamation of Cork's marshlands in construction of new stone buildings, quays and waterways was influenced in no small way by the expertise of Dutch civil engineers, who were greatly admired for their expertise, it's two expertises in the same sentence, in reclaiming and developing marshy environments. Engravings of the period, such as John Watt's view of Cork, show Cork as a water-based city with gable-fronted houses called Dutch Billies, similar to the houses that line the quaysides of Amsterdam and Utrecht. The Crawford Art Gallery on Emmett Place, Civic Trust House on Hope's Quay and Queen Anne's House are examples of Dutch-style architecture, and numbers 73 and 74 South Mall is reputed to have build, been built using Dutch brick. Um, the Mardijk was designed by Edward Weber, who was himself of Dutch descent, and named in honour of Meerdijk, an area in Amsterdam. All right? So how true are these ideas? This well-known view certainly gives a strongly Dutch impression. The rows of red brick houses on the quay side there. Um, and in, fa in fairness, between 1760 and 1800, the Dutch appearance of Cork was frequently commented, commented on by, by visitors to the city. They would come and they would say, oh, Cork is very like a Dutch city. This is a close-up view from a similar viewpoint to the painting I showed you earlier. And you can see all of these gable-fronted houses here, rows of them here. This is where Cudmore's used to be at the top of Winthrop Street, all of these houses here. And then over the other side here, this is kind of um, uh, George's Quay. More very Dutch-looking little houses all lined up. And even here on, on Lavert's Quay, more Dutch-style houses. But are they really Dutch? And do any remain today? Before we go further, uh, let's briefly investigate about what Dutch people knew about Cork in the 16th century. These images I'm going to show you here are all from the Rijksmuseum collection. And they would have been expensive items and they wouldn't necessarily have been things that many people would have got to see. Certainly more educated, wealthy people would have seen them. The 16th century, sorry, the 17th century, was the most violent in the history of Ireland, which is no small feat. It began in 1601 with the destination of the aristocratic rem remnants of Gaelic society at the Battle of Kinsale. You can see at the top there, there's an image of the Battle of Kinsale in Ireland by Franz Hürgenberg. Um, so some people, at least in Holland, were following these, these, these conflicts quite closely. At least one non-military event in Cork was recorded by a Dutch artist, which is this one here. This is what was called the Battle of the Starlings in 1622. And it's actually mentioned on the timeline in the Rembrandt exhibition, if you care to have a look at that when you're going there on the show. Um, now, obviously the person who drew this had never been to Cork, because none of this looks anything like any other views of Cork in the 17th century. 
I love this castle. And these mountains are beautiful, right? The title is A Square in Cork, where the people are looking at the um, fighting of the starlings in the sky, 1621. Um, now, I think the person who drew this had been given some sort of idea of what Cork was like. So I think this is supposed to be Shandon Castle and the kind of the hills of the north side here. Maybe this is St. Finbar's Cathedral, I don't know. But there's obviously a lot of imagination going there. So, so the, the Dutch were aware of things happening in Ireland, but maybe not specifics of it. Uh, another example here, this is from the 1640s. Now the northern parts of the Netherlands were strongly Protestant, while the south, present-day Belgium, the area around Maastricht, were majority Catholic. This is a propaganda piece called Atrocities Against the Irish Protestants, probably uh, created in the north of Holland, to ferment anti-Catholic feeling following a rebellion of Catholics in the 1640s. So you don't need to look too closely, but there's pretty nasty things happening here. People having hot irons put on them, people being disemboweled, babies being put on spits here. Uh, this, is, this is not very subtle at all. But obviously, because of their own religious wars, the Dutch are quite aware of what's happening in Ireland in the 17th century. And this kind of culminates at the end of the century in the 1780s and 90s, after what the British like to call the Glorious Revolution in 1688, whereby Willem, Prince of Orange, became King of England and Ireland through his wife Mary, the niece of Charles II. So he didn't really have much of a great claim on the throne, uh, but he was a Protestant, so it suited um, the Parliament and the aristocracy to get him in there. Now, the Dutch seem to have followed the battles of um, Williamite Wars fairly closely, so here's a plaint called The Taking of Cork, and this one is called War in Ireland. These are both contemporary with the events. Again, it's quite a fanciful idea of what Cork looks like. Here's the north side, there's Rana Rana, nice and mountainy. Um, and the, in, the view is taken from the south side, taken from around Elizabeth Fort, Blarney Street, that area, or, or rather it's not taken from there, but it's imagined from there. And here is um, rows and rows of pikemen and cannons and all sorts of things happening. And there's another view, similar view, but by a competing artist. Um, and obviously when William and Mary take over as King and Queen of Ireland, there's probably a degree of pride in Holland about the fact that the king, this, this um, prince of, of Holland is now actually king of, of, of another country. And a number of Dutch soldiers and military engineers were involved in William's campaign and some no doubt stay behind, at least for a while. Um, but as well as this kind of intervention by Dutch people in Ireland, there was always Irish people the other way. So for example, somewhat earlier than this, in 1633, there were 14 marriages in Amsterdam um, of Irish people, okay? Now that doesn't sound a particularly large number, but there are only 25 marriages of British people. So the number of Irish people getting married in Amsterdam is completely disproportionate to the population. And remember, that's 1633, that's one year, one city. So you could probably multiply that by a factor of five or 10 per annum. Um, so there's quite a lot of mixing between Irish and Dutch people. Literally, you know, getting married and, and having families together. So returning to Cork, who were the Dutch who settled here? Um, now, after a lot of research, I've come up with these names in the period between 1620 and 1835. And we don't know, obviously, the full number of Dutch people. Um, these records, th these names come from records of people who get involved with the, the state in Ireland, who buy land or get married um, or have, who, who make a will here, okay? Um, many other people must have, have visited Cork or traded with Cork but left no trace. And the other thing is, these would have all been Protestants. Um, any Dutch-speaking Catholics who came here wouldn't be so easy to find in the records that we have. Uh, but the impression I'm getting is that the number of settlers from the Low Countries was not large, certainly smaller than the Huguenot, the French Huguenot immigrants. But they seem to have had quite a disproportionate influence. The earlier settlements, these people here in the 1620s, were enticed to come to Charleville and set up as uh, textile manufacturers in the town, the new town of Charleville. Uh, and this is fairly typical. Being Protestants, they were quite an attractive 
route for a Protestant Irish landowner to get to come and live in their towns and villages, just like the Huguenots were for the same reason. And in addition, some of the English military officers who served in Ireland in the 17th century had previous experience of serving in the Low Countries earlier in the century. So there is this kind of movement of, of expertise and people backwards and forwards all the time. Now, not all encounters between the Dutch and the Cork people went well. Um, there's a record from 1746 of a, a cultural misunderstanding during a, a ceremony that Cork people called Branning the Mayor, um, which consisted of, in October of each year, when the mayor was announced and, and, and taken through the city in his pomp, people would stand at the side with handfuls of bran flour and throw it at the mayor and his party until he was covered in you know, dirt and food, basically. And it would turn into a giant food fight, a bit like the kind of things you see in, in uh, Spain to this day. Uh, it came from the same idea as, as throwing rice at weddings. It was to do with plenty and celebrating and you know, good fortune to you. But obviously it was also a bit of fun and everyone got messy. But this is from 1746. I was told the story of a Dutchman who was assaulted by these brand mongers in such a manner that being ignorant of their custom, he drew his knife and was going to snicker away with all his might. But before he did any mischief, he was seized behind, his weapon taken from him, and himself dragged through the channel of the river, which is none the cleanest. After this, they filled his drawers, pockets, shirt, etc., full of the ingredients, and hooted him to the waterside, where he flung himself into a boat and put off from the shore to avoid their further persecution. So I imagine he had a tale to tell when he got back to Amsterdam. So what brought all these Dutch people to our town, to our city? Um, well, the vast majority of them were involved in trade and business, as far as I can say. see. Um, in the 1730s, it could take about 12 days to get from Rotterdam to Cork by sea. Uh, and Rotterdam was the major port for goods going to Munster, rather than, rather than Amsterdam or Den Haag. Um, now, that sounds pretty bad, 13 days. That, that's kind of inclement weather, but it could take five or seven days to get from Dublin to Cork. So that's actually pretty good going to get all that distance in 13 days. So we were, we were quite well integrated in, in terms of transport leaks. Now, what we were, what we were um, buying from the Low Countries were luxury items, spices, paintings, toys, silks, fine linen, ceramics, brick, and rum, which had been re-exported from the Caribbean. And what we were selling to them was beef, butter, animal bones, tallow hides, like um, agricultural products and byproducts. Now, the other thing that would happen is the Dutch vessels would come to Cork with these luxury items. They'd either bring the beef and butter back to the Low Countries, or they would possibly take it from Cork and bring it to the Caribbean. So in this case, we were exporting in Dutch vessels salted meat and fish, butter, porter, and then we were importing from the Caribbean sugar, coffee, cotton, fruit, oils, tobacco, spices. In times of war, the Dutch would come into Cork Harbour pretending to be buying food for their own consumption, but really they would be taking it back out, re-exporting it to France, because there was an embargo on... Uh, actually, if anyone else has got their phone on, just you can turn off there. There was an embargo on, on exports to the French Caribbean when England was at war with France, obviously. So the Dutch got around it by ex importing it and re-exporting. They were amoral, I think, is, is the word uh, that scholars use in terms of their trade. It was, it was all about the money. Now, one thing that rarely gets a mention is, is who was eating all of this salted meat and fish and butter, and who was drinking the porter? Now, most of the meat that made its way to the French Caribbean was fed to enslaved Africans. Um, and in the British colonies, most of the meat went to planters and supervisors on, on the plantations rather than the slaves themselves. The plantation economy only existed. Um, it required imported food. If you imagine a fairly small island in the Caribbean, with lots of people living on it, if you turn it all over to subsistence farming, then there's no land left to grow 
grow your coffee or your sugar cane or cotton or whatever. So you want to use that land on those islands to produce the cash crop and then you need to feed slaves with food that you've got from somewhere else. So in this, Cork is culpable in the colonization and slavery of America and the Caribbean. And I let you mull over that, I let you mull over another thing. If you look here at what we're buying from the Low Countries, these are all fairly, apart from the bricks, which I'll return to, these are all quite lightweight, small little things, high value, low volume. Whereas what we're selling are massive, bulky oak barrels full of food or drink. Um, so the vessels that came to Cork were very lightly freighted. So they would need ballast weight literally to stop them from toppling over and sinking in the middle of the English Channel. So they used something for ballast and we'll return to that in a minute. So this was a kind of the direct trade relationship between us and the Dutch and the Caribbean and North America. But there was an indirect and in the long term more significant and longer lasting relationship which is to do with the way that the Dutch uh, economy developed very early and very sophisticated ways of dealing with money and transferring money. So for example, the first international stock exchange was established in Antwerp in the 16th century, and that was the direct model for the London Stock Exchange in 1571, and then the Royal Exchange in Dublin in 1769. Again, the Bank of England was founded in 1694 as a private bank. It was founded with Dutch expertise to fund a war, and William and Mary, the King and Queen, were two of the original stockholders. And the model for the Bank of England was obviously, sorry, the Bank of Ireland followed the model for the Bank of England about a century later. So all of these kind of forces began the process of what we today call globalisation. So those are Dutch people again. I, I don't know how Hertz van Rental got in there. He's actually not a real person. <laughs> So, quite a lot of these people became wealthy enough that they started buying land and selling land in Cork or renting land. Um, they tended to marry um, local Cork Protestants, but sometimes they married amongst themselves or they married Huguenot families, some of whom they probably would have known um, from trade. The peak, of, oh, big pardon, the peak of the Dutch influence in Cork seems to have passed by 1750. It seems to be something that happened in the late 17th century, mid to late 17th century, early 18th century, and then fades away. Nonetheless, there were some notable contributors to Cork life. So I mention here the Van Leeuwens, who seem to be in Cork from the early, um, from actually they were in Cork in the late 17th century, that date is wrong, I beg your pardon. So there was a chap called John Van Leeuwen, uh, who was born in 1684, son of a Guisbert, and he was born in Mallow. Um, he studied in, in Utrecht um, to become a doctor, which I'm imagining is probably the same place his father had, had trained. And he graduated in Utrecht in 1705 and returned to Ireland. And he became one of Ireland's very first obstetricians. And he was the president of the Royal College of Surgeons in the 1730s. His daughter, Leticia, um, Leticia Pil Pilkington was her married name, was a poet. Um, quite a good one, and a friend of Swift. James Vandeleur, there are the Vandeleurs over there, um, was mayor of Cork in 1663, which suggests this family had been here for a while before that. You don't just suddenly rock up in Cork and become the mayor, even in the 17th century. Um, and there's a, a lane on the North Main Street that's still called to this day Vandeleur's Lane. The Weber family, where are they? Oh, I've deleted them. Oh, there they are. Um, seem to have been in Cork since the 1650s, starting with an Edward, who became mayor in 1684, and there was, there was a Weber's Lane in Cork. Uh, his son, also Edward, became MP for Cork in 1727, and is the chap who laid out the Mardike from, 16, from 1799, and this is a fairly solid historical fact. However, the name Mardike is more problematic. Um, it's been stated by many, including myself, to be an Amsterdam name. But um, a contemporary writer, Charles Smith, writing in 1750, makes no mention of the link at all, or anything to do with Holland. 
Uh, and confusingly, the Mar Lake often went under the name of the Red House Walk, so the two were interchangeable. Mar Lake wasn't the dominant name. And more, more oddly, the name, there are several Mar Dykes across Ireland. Um, there's one in Skibbereen, there's one in Athlone, and there's one in Killinall, County Tipperary. Now, Mar Dyke is supposed to mean the dike by the sea, near as the Dutch for sea. Uh, but you'd be hard pushed to find a sea in either Killinall or Athlone. There's also a river in London called the Mardyke, and there's a quayside in Bristol called the Mardyke, uh, in quite a fashionable area, just below Clifton in Bristol. And I suspect that the Webbers, Edward, may have named it Mardyke because of the link to Bristol, or possibly London, rather than Amsterdam, because when you look at the map of Amsterdam, there is no Mar Dyke or Mir Dyke. And there doesn't seem to have ever been one. Um, that could change if I can do a bit more research on it, but I haven't found any reference to one. There's a village in Holland called, or a town in Holland called Mur Dyke, which means not, not, not Dyke, but no Mar Dyke. And there's also the suggestion that the Webbers weren't Dutch at all, but were Crom Cromwellian settlers, so there's a lot more to figure out about this. Um, Theodor van Sevenhoven is a bit more historically solid, and I'll come back to him in a minute. But I'd like to speak for a minute, uh, um, a second, oh, I have to delete it, bugger. Um, I'd like to speak for a second about a family called the Vosters. Now, Elias Foster was a Dutchman, we're very certain of this, born about 1682, who arrived in Cork at the very end of the 17th century. He married in 1702 to a woman with a very Dutch name, who I'm guessing came over from the Low Countries with him, and had two children, at least, Judith and Daniel. Daniel had three daughters, and the family, um, partly because of the fact that there were so many daughters, the name was bred out, if you know what I mean, so there wasn't like a third generation of fosters. Um, Elias set up as a merchant, but seems to have made most of his money as an accountant advising other businesses. And he set up a business school because the skills that he had in terms of managing money and understanding exchange rates and, and setting up deals were very valuable to the court merchants. And not only did he set up uh, a business school, he wrote this book, Vosta Elmatus, or the rules of arithmetic digested and explained in the mercantile course of questions, examples, pertinent, etc. etc. Um, now, this isn't the original first edition, this is a later edition, but it's thought around 1725 he came up with the first edition of this. And, and this, amongst other things, explained double entry bookkeeping, um, which I have no idea how it works, um, but if I did, I probably wouldn't go and look at that because <laughs> I think it would probably confuse me even more. Um, now, this school that he set up was on, well, this, this is the map of 1759 that marks something called Mr. Foster's. Academy, um, and it's highly likely that Mr. Foster is actually Mr. Foster. But this is Paul Street here, this is where we are, this building here, then the Custom House, now the Crawford. And basically, Paul Street shopping centre is here, and that little side street that's been broken up there, where um, a nice cafe is, I've forgotten the name of. Anyway, uh, just in the corner there, that's Mr. Foster's or Mr. Foster's Academy. Foster's son Daniel continued to run the, uh, the school later and indeed edit and, and modify and improve the, the book and it went through many editions. But his main interest was in scientific instruments. So he work, worked on surveying instruments and sundials and all sorts of things. John Van Nost the Younger was a sculptor and his link to Cork was the design and construction of this um, long lost statue to George II. What you're looking at here is Parliament Bridge, South Mall, Grand Parade over here, and obviously the south branch of the, of the Lee. Not that the National Monument is about here, so that's where we are more or less. Now, the younger Van Nost was born in London, and he was the nephew of a, another Jan Van Nost, who was a Flemish British sculptor. The younger John, or Jan, worked predominantly in Ireland, and he was commissioned by Cork Corporation in 1759 to create this statue of George II. Um, and he chose lead 
for the statue, which was not uncommon, um, especially in gar uh, garden and stately home statuary. Um, it was also a good deal cheaper, um, which led the city council to paint it yellow. Some people say it was plated in gold, but I think if you're going to plate it in gold, then why not just make the thing out of bronze in the first place and do it properly? But anyway, um, and even though this statue was removed in the 1860s by, by Republicans and decapitated, um, the Irish name for the Grand Parade, or one of the Irish names, is Shrine and Cup and Bui, the Street of the Yellow Horse, which obviously refers to George sitting on his horse. Now, the, it, originally, this equestrian statue didn't stand here, but it was much, much further up the street, more or less where the Berwick Fountain is today. There was a bridge there over a canal, Grand Parade was a canal at that point, and the intention was to imitate the statue of George I, which stood on Essex Bridge in Dublin. I'd say it had this bridge with a statue on it. And that statue, in turn, was inspired by the statue of Henri V, fifth, fourth, which stood on the Pont Neuf in Paris since 1618. So this little, or not little, this, this monument has kind of got a direct lineage back to Paris of the 17th century. When it comes to painting, I suppose the best known would be William van der Hagen, um, who flourished in Ireland in the 1720s and 30s and early 40s, and he is best known in Cork anyway for this view of, of Cork Harbour. Um, a far better painting, in my humble opinion, and Michael Waldron will be able to correct me, um, is his view of Waterford, done a couple of years earlier. And if you look at this image, you'll see that this style of Dutch landscape painting is probably what's influencing the very first image I showed you, the, the, um, the Butts painting of Cork. I'll also point out, not so clear, and apologies for the quality here, but there's a little Dutch gabled house right on the side there, you see them? There were other Dutch influences on Cork, including yachting, garden design, and medicine. But the country may have also had an influence on the role, on the development rather, of our firefighting capability. This gentleman here, Jan van der Heyden, the elder, there's lots of elders and youngers here, <coughs> apologies, um, was a, a kind of a Leonardo figure, um, as well as being an engineer, and this print here is illustrating the old way of firefighting and the new way of firefighting. They're kind of um, machines for spitting out water, what they are, hoses and pumps and things. Um, he and his family developed technology for firefighting, which was um, extremely useful in a canal system town. That's not very good English, I'll start that again. They could use the water in the canals and suck it out and pump it directly onto the fire so they didn't need to have people with buckets or find natural bodies of water. They could just use the water out of the canals. They also invented the hose, right? Um, which they called a water snake or a water spitter. Um, so you, you kind of think hoses, should, hoses are just hoses, should they've been around forever, but no. Um, van der Hayden and his family developed these hoses and developed ways of pumping water like this to fight fires. And they're, 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 in the 1690s they, they wrote a book on it and it became the state of the art way of firefighting for almost a century after that. Now, according to Pat Poland, the historian of Cork Fire Brigade, it's very likely that Cork City Council's first fire engine came from Amsterdam in 1714, 1715. So, you know, that gives you an idea of they're looking for a new fire engine. They just go, let's just go where they know what they're doing. Let's just go for the best one. Now, as well as an artist, sorry, engineer, he was also an artist. So he created this um, engraving here, but he also did that painting. So he was a kind of multi-skilled individual, uh, hence my kind of fatuous comment about Leonardo earlier, but he's quite an interesting character. His whole family are, are fascinating. So I mentioned earlier when I was talking about um, the trade, the food and uh, different uh, trades between us and the Dutch. 
The problem of ballast, the fact that the Dutch would have to bring something to Cork to stop their boats tipping over, which would then have to be unloaded in Cork so that they could fit barrels and um, bottles and whatever they're, they're taking away. And it's often said that uh, buildings, some buildings in Cork are built of Dutch brick. Um, this one is, oh, sorry about that. As you can see from the addresses there, this is George's Key and this is, this is South Mount. Now the architect, Henry Horton Hill, seems to have been the first person to identify these as, as Dutch bricks based on the size and colour. And it's certainly true that these are not Irish or British bricks. These are from somewhere else. Maybe, maybe even probably Holland. Now, according to Susan Roundtree, who's writing or about to publish a history of, of Irish brick, between 1700 and 1749, the amount of brick imported was very modest. She says that in many years, um, no more brick than would be needed to build a single house was imported. So the idea that there was billions of bricks coming from Holland doesn't, doesn't seem to come through in the, the data anyway. Um, she says, in fairness, that Cork was the main port of entry for Dutch brick in the first half of the 18th century, but she only counts 300,000 bricks in those 50 years. Now, in the 1780s, Cork was making 3 million bricks Cork City was making its own bricks to the tune of 3 million per year. So really 300,000 in 50 years is a drop in the ocean. It's really not significant. However, we don't know about ballast. These are kind of official imports. We don't know what happened to all the bricks that were in the ballast. Were they re-exported? We still don't know. But these possibly are made from ballast. So what are the other possible Dutch influences? We've talked about the fire brigade, we've talked about um, global trade, world trade, Atlantic trade, um, and possibly the bricks. Well, I suppose, going back to the piece from the Echo earlier, um, there's kind of an assumption that the canals were influenced or aided or helped by, by Dutch engineers. Um, and this is Broke's map from 1759. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I'll just point out the canals. Now the waterways, the big ones are the ones we know still today, but there's a canal down here, up here, down here, disappears underground, there's a canal going down here, there's a canal down the south now there, a canal down Patrick Street, a canal in front of the um, Crawford Art Gallery, a canal on Coal Quay, a canal down Arnell Place, you get the picture. It really is quite like a Dutch city that way. Now, I stand to be corrected and I'd love to find the smoking gun, but I haven't found any evidence in the city minutes or anywhere that any Dutch people were involved in, in any of this canal canalization, I'm calling it. Um, like it seems likely, doesn't it? I mean, that's where you'd go if you wanted expertise. And if we were going to the Dutch to learn about firefighting, why wouldn't we go to them to learn about canals? But there just doesn't seem to be any evidence yet. Oops. Drawbridges. Now Cork had, at this time, it had a drawbridge here. This is Drawbridge Street, Names gives a clue. And then at the end of Drawbridge Street, going across to what's now Merchants Key Shopping Centre, there was a drawbridge. And there was another drawbridge here. And when they finally built Patrick's Bridge, the top end of that was also a portcullisy drawbridge-y thing. Um, now, Amazingly, even though that drawbridge was there for nearly a century, I've never seen a drawing of it. I don't think, again, I'd be very happy to be corrected, but I don't think anyone has ever seen what that drawbridge looked like. It may have looked like this. This is from the Rijks Museum again. Um, beautifully weighted and cantilevered design. Uh, but really, we just don't know. So again, the Dutch could have helped us with this design, or we could have tried to do it ourselves. We don't know. And then windmills. Now I suppose here I'm really on very thin ice because obviously Irish people have been well able to make windmills for, for centuries before the Dutch uh, relationship. But there were at least two windmills in Cork. Um, this is on this was on, was on Windmill Road in Capwell. Again, the place name kind of gives you a clue. Capwell seems to come from Capwell, the bald, exposed hilltop. 
which is exactly where you want to put a windmill on top of a bald exposed hilltop. And then St. Patrick's Hill, it's widely maintained that this is now Bruce College, but the drum shape here is because originally there was a windmill on the top of that. So did we get help from them? The Dutch for designing these? Maybe. Again, we don't have any evidence yet. And then there's things like the draining of, of parts of the city, like the Marder, was there was there specialist um, help there. So returning to our view of Cork, I want to spend the remainder of the talk looking at housing and this idea of, of Dutch houses, Dutch billies, sometimes people call them. So this view here is the, is the whole panorama and basically all these keys, this would be um, Curls Key going down to the North Gate Bridge, all along here. It's all these gable fronted, very Dutch looking houses. So were they Dutch is the first question. Where did the style originate? And was there any contribution of actual Dutch people? Now we do have a solid example of at least one Dutch train designer who came to Cork, but it doesn't help our investigation very much. Rudolf Cornel, who was a Dutch-born Huguenot, the Dutch and the Huguenots were very integrated. He was French, you know, by culture, but born in Holland, trained in Holland as a military architect, and he worked on Elizabeth Fort in the 1690s. But there's no word of him doing any domestic work. Um, you can't really imagine this very, you know, serious military engineer. Somebody saying, could you do a couple of houses for us while you're here? Doesn't seem likely. So, this is a collection of um, most of our remaining early 18th century brick buildings. And what evidence do we have from these of a Dutch influence? So, I'll just, for, just to make sure we know what we're talking about, this is Pope's Key, this is Fenn's Key. This is the little house across the road. I wish I could get rid of that bit, I can't. And this is the building that we're sitting in right now. Because we've only really got four examples, it's quite hard to generalise or analyse. Um, and also, very little has been published on any of these, so we don't have a great deal of data to look at. There are actually quite a lot more houses from this period in Cork but many of them have been modified so much that it's hard to know what we will get from many, them either. But what I think is quite interesting is when this building was eight years old, so basically brand new, a French visitor described it as in the Italian manner. He didn't say anything about it being Dutch. He, he, he saw this as Italian. Now, we don't know how much he knew about architecture, but when he saw this, he didn't think, oh, that's French or English. He said, oh, that looks Italian. And I suppose he's talking about the classical details here. Another example that's often given, and I wish that red paint wasn't on it, this is the Uniac or Red House on the main street in York, dated to around 1709. Now, the name associated with this is a man called Leuventhen, or sometimes Leuventhen, and there's a suggestion that his first name may have been Claude. Um, now, when I was, I did a couple of walking tours in association with this exhibition and with this presentation, and I was lucky enough to have some Dutch people on one of the tours, and I mentioned the name Lewenthin, and the woman, well, the woman I was talking to, or talking at at the time, she raised an eyebrow like that, and kind of went, Lewenthin. <laughs> and sure enough, if you, you know, go on to genealogy websites, um, Dutch genealogy websites as I have done, this day, Leuventhin or Leuventhin, it just doesn't exist. You Google Leuventhin and the only thing you get is stuff to do with the Red House in York, right? Um, there doesn't seem to be a Dutch name, Leuventhin, or if there was, it, it, is now, it has now completely died out. That's the other possibility, it could have been a very unusual, rare name. There's also no record of Leuventhin or Leuventhin in Cork. But again, that's not that relevant because unless he got married or bought land or made a will here, he wouldn't pop up 
um, in our records either. So I decided I would chase back, you know, where, where does this come from, this attribution? And the oldest attribution i found so far, and again, I'm absolutely delighted for someone to pop up at the end and say, I'm this guy's great, great grandfather, so, so he does exist. The oldest reference I can get for this man is 1967, from the Shell Book of the Road, that well-known historical <laughs> archive. <laughs> now, the person who wrote the Shell Book of the Road, he may have had the original drawings, he may be completely right. I, I, I shouldn't be mocking, but I haven't found any other corroborating efforts. So I'm now really very dubious about this, and dubious about the whole Dutchness of that. Um, it actually, when you, when you compare it to this one, it's actually much more like this house in Cork than any house I, I'm familiar with in Holland, but again, prepared to be convert, uh, contradicted. Now, if you, you don't have to go quite as far as Holland to find things that are quite similar to Cox's early 17th century houses. So this one is in Bristol, number 29 Queen Square, same date as um, our Red House. Uh, I mean, it is, it is not the same, I'm not pretending that, but there's a certain kind of mannerism, a certain kind of crudity to that, that you see on this house as well. Um, obviously a different, it's Bath stone rather than um, our lovely limestone. Um, and then this one is in the Pall Mall in London, Schoenberg House. This is, oops, beg your pardon, a very late 19th, 18th century, so 17th century house. Now there, bizarrely there is an Irish link between this house, so there's an Irish link to this house, which is that Marshal Schoenberg was a German um, guy who became a naturalised Frenchman and died on the Battle of the Boyne. Um, and again, if you Google Schoenberg House, you get loads of stuff about the Orange Order because the Orange Order Museum in Belf Belfast is called Schoenberg House. But this is the original one. Now, according to John Summerson, this has a French feel to it, he claims. Um, and this one is seen by Bristol architectural historians as having a Dutch influence, right? So the, the question then arises, well, maybe these do have a Dutch influence, a dilute Dutch influence, but did we get it from Bristol and London, or did we get it straight from the source? In other words, did the idea come filtered through English design ideas, or did we get some Dutch architect stepping off a boat in 1699 with all these great ideas? Now again, the evidence isn't there yet to decide. So this image again, I had planned to kind of pan across this, but I can't do that for technical reasons. But I want to talk about these things, Dutch billies. The, the houses I've shown you up to now are quite high status, one-off, detached buildings. Um, Dutch billies is the name the Dubliners give for those little, um, little cookie cutter houses all along the key sides. It's not really a, a term that is in wide use outside of Dublin. Now, in terms of British architecture, this seems to be the origination of the style. This drawing was made by an architect in 1619. He's not, it's not a design for his own design, but it's something he saw in Hoburn in London, and he thought, geez, that's pretty cool, that's new, I'll have that, and, and he sketched it down. Um, and this, oops, I beg your pardon, this style of architecture became very popular very quickly across England, and it came to Ireland by the mid 17th century. So, even before then, I mean, by the early 18th century, you have things like the market house and courthouse are for sale. And not the exchange so much, but look at these buildings here and this one here. It's kind of getting there, isn't it? Yeah. So this is quite a well established style by the 18th century. In fact, it's probably a bit old hat. So when the 18th century visitors that I mentioned earlier come to Cork and they talk about it being Dutch, they're very familiar with this kind of architecture, right? Across Britain and Ireland. Like I showed you them in the, the painting of, of, Water, of Waterford as well. So they don't see them as specifically Dutch anymore. They might have done in 1619, but by 17, 
50, they're just houses. That's just what a house looks like. It's not a Dutch house, it's just a house house. What they call Dutch when they come to Cork is the canals and the drawbridges. They describe those as Dutch rather than the buildings. Now since 1800 or 1830, almost all of these Dutch gabled buildings in Cork, this is a really unusual example here in Kinsale, have all disappeared. So when we see the painting of Butts View of Cork, we think, we don't think, oh, that's Cork in the olden days. We think, oh, that's like Amsterdam or Rotterdam or The Hague or wherever. So we see them as Dutch now, but we wouldn't have seen them as Dutch then. That's not to say that we don't have any gable fronted. And by gable fronted, I mean that the roof is complete and faces the road. We, don't, we do have a number of these in Cork. So this one's on Fens Quay. It's quite a nice example. It's a very nice example, actually. These, this one's on Pope's Key and George's Key. And in the case of these ones, you can see basically the top of that roof has been chopped off. And the top of that roof has been chopped off. But what always gives it away is there's always a different number of windows on this floor than there is on that floor. Okay? So you can see that the original intention of the design was gable fronted. And then there's this totally bizarre example as well. Now, the antiquarian John Rindle described this building as Dutch, but I think he was being very kind. I think it's just horrible. <laughs> My, I'm an architectural historian, so I'm supposed to go, oh, it's a really old building, it must be nice, but no, it's not, it's horrible. Um, now, what confuses people, a lot of people, is that this style of gable-fronted building was revived in the 19th century. So a lot of the examples you're thinking of, and here I'm particularly thinking of um, What's it called? Something in Bean. It's a cafe across from the Berwick Fountain. It's a beautiful double gable fronted building on the Bean corner. It's Bean and Leaf. Thank you very much. On the corner of Grand Parade and on Plunkett Street. That's, that's a 19th or maybe even a 20th century building, um, which is harking back to this style. It's not a, as far as I know, it's not a 17th or 18th century building. So I'm just going to return for a few minutes to the gentleman I mentioned earlier, Theodor van Sevenhoven, because uh, something is actually known of him and he gives a flavour of the role of Dutch people in, in Holland, in the, sorry, in Ireland in the early 18th century. His name, Sevenhoven, well, Hof is, is a place of, of prominence or importance and Hoven is the plural of Hof. So Sevenhoven means seven important places. Um, he was a very cos they were a very cosmopolitan family, the Sevenhovens, so sometimes they used the French version of their name, which they translated as Sept Septgrange, um, which I think means seven barons. He was born around 1680, and he was the grandson of a Dutch banker in La Rochelle. There's a very strong link between Amsterdam and the west coast of France. Uh, some of the west coast towns in France were quite largely Protestant. And his grandfather was very well to do and had a country house and a grand estate. But in about 1690, many Huguenots and Dutch people were forced out of France because the French king revoked what was called the, what was called the Edict of Nantes, which gave certain um, license to Protestants to practice their religion and, and do certain trades. He revoked that and said, okay, right, now you're going to be a Catholic or you get out. And a lot of Huguenots, maybe 300,000, left. And the Dutch with them. Now, Theodore seems to have arrived in Cork around 1700, about the same time as Elias Roster. And he may have lived here with his cousin, Theodore Lavoie. You can guess again, you can see again that interlinking between the French Huguenot and the, the Dutch. Theodore died in Cork in 1723, so we know at least some of the time he was here. And the Van Sevenhovens and the Loas, they traded with this big extended family that stretched from New York, which had been called New Amsterdam, don't forget, until 1664. London, Rotterdam, La Rochelle, back across the Atlantic and across down up and down the English Channel. Now, why am I showing you this picture? Well, the time this map was created in 1750, this key 
Here's the um, Customs House, now the Cloth and Art Gallery. And this is now um, Emmett Place. This key, which we know as Lavitt's key, was called Seven Havens, or sometimes Seven Ovens key. Uh, apparently nobody could get Van Sevenhoven correct, so they just called it Seven Ovens. Now it seems probable to me that this building here may have been Van Sevenhoven's property. If I was wealthy enough to have a whole key named after me, I would want to have the biggest house on the key. It wouldn't make sense to be living in this one when you could have that one. And it consists of a three-story block here at the back and two wings at the sides. You see these? Kind of coming forward. Now, this is the um, view of Cork by Charnley and Chambers. And this is what's painting, a kind of close-up. And this is great because it shows us, you see these red doors here and here, and the kind of the hood there and there. That tells us these are storehouses of some sort, not residential. So you can imagine a Dutch-style crane there, winching goods up and keeping them inside those, those wings. Whereas this is the residential section at the back. Okay? And rather grand it is too. Now, as we pointed out that Van Sevenhoven seems to have died around 1738. So these images were both done after he passed away. Um, now, one of the notable things is that there's a very grand set of piers and iron gates here, and then quite a deep courtyard behind that. So what you need to imagine is whoever owned this house, and, and I am speculating, I have to admit, would have driven in here with their carriage, got out, and then the carriage would have been taken away, maybe down on Perry Street, and then maybe stored, or possibly stored, underneath these buildings. But you all know that the city centre of Cork is reclaimed from the, the marsh, okay? At great physical cost and expense over centuries. So land prices were high and people tended to use every square inch, hence the fact that there are no parks or gardens in the city, city centre. So to have quite a large courtyard outside your house like this was as good as gold plating the whole bloody thing. Anybody walking past there thinking, whoa, I mean, look at this as a bigger house. It's that one, two, three, four storey. There's a little, little yard, well not even a yard, just steps there. And these ones are right out on the street. This guy clearly has some cash. And indeed, when you look on the map of the same year, you can see this big open courtyard there, and I'm speculating this is Van Sevenhoven's house. This is the customs house, it's now the art gallery, and there's the drawbridge that I mentioned earlier as well. Now, that house, if it is Van Sevenhoven's house, um, was built after his original house was destroyed and pulled down by a mob in 1709. He and other foreign merchants were blamed for food shortages in the city and his home was attacked and destroyed. Which may also explain this high security fence here perhaps. Again, I have to admit, I am speculating. He also, so he bought land in this area in 1711. He was elected to Cork Corporation in 1721, so he's going up the social scale here. And by 1738, he owned 400 acres, probably 640 statute acres, and a house south of Middleton called Ram Hill. So he, was, he did very well for himself. The key, the remain seven ovens key, until about the 1820s when it became Lavitt's Key. You'll notice that Lavitt's Key is here on the other side of um, Emmett Place. And basically, Lavitt's Key moved round the corner and became Seven Ovens Key, which is very representative of the way that the Dutch influence in Cork has, has petered out and faded away in the 18th century. But the, the French Huguenot influence is still there. You still have people of Huguenot extraction start um, serving as, law, as mayor of Cork and, and being very important locally, whereas the Dutch have kind of petered out. So I'm just going to finish by asking the question, is there anything left of all of this today, all of this architecture? 
And amazingly, the answer seems to be yes. This is Stephen Levin's key, or Lavick's key today. And Larry Tompkins' bar. You'll notice there are three windows here and two there. You'll also notice that this is basically a stage set, a bit like you'd see in a Wild West movie, right? And there's a, a gate, there is actually a gable fronted building behind this that wants to get out, okay? And then this building here is the same width as this one. Now it's been um, sympathetically modernized. <laughs> in the finest taste, but I think if we went back and found an older photograph that we'd, we'd find this as a mirror image of that, okay? And now this part was only built in 1990, and I think um, I found a photograph from the late 50s that shows basically nothing at all in this space. If you look at the aerial view, there's Larry Tompkins's, there's Egan's, there's this building here. So if you take Tom Egan's out of the equation and you put the big house in there, you can see that the fine grain and the memory of these maybe probably early 18th century buildings are still on the street cakescape today. And this is actually fairly typical in Cork. You can, we tend to think of the of Cork being quite modern in terms of its architecture and talk about the Victorian court or, you know, whatever. But often when you dig and you start looking, you find the grain and the remnants of much, much older buildings. So, to sum up, um, in terms of the Dutch influence, the way I see it is the biggest influence on the city was short term, anyway, it was the merchants and the commercial life that they brought to the place. The expansion of banking, accountancy, and Atlantic trade. And in fact, trade still remains important between us and Holland. So, according to the Cork of Cork website, in 2017, the country, that's this country, exported over 5.5 billion euros of goods to the Netherlands. This makes the Netherlands the sixth biggest export destination for Irish goods. In the same year, Ireland imported 3.5 billion euros. Okay? Um, so, there's still obviously very important trade and cultural links between us. It's also true that a number of Dutch people made considerable contributions to the city in ways not to do directly with trade. And as we've seen, there are some examples of, of Dutch art and um, culture in terms of landscapes, yachting, statuary, etc. Um, however, some of our cherished Dutch links in terms of place names, Dutch billies, ballast brick, architecture, and the design of the city, while they remain plausible, in my opinion, the claims are tantalizing, but without clear foundation. So thank you for listening. And I'll take any questions um, when I can see you.